Hi, and welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian, and my co-host is Austin Chadwick. And today we have Barb Oakley, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the neuroscience of learning. So, Barb, would you like to give us a little introduction, and then maybe we can jump into the topic? Okay, well, let's see. I hated math and science growing up, uh, which is ironic since I'm now a distinguished professor of engineering. And I started out my working career as a, I went to the Defense Language Institute and learned Russian. And now I'm ending up as a uh, a professor of engineering. Uh, And so it's kind of a, a little bit of whiplash in my learning career. But part of that has involved just learning how we learn and learning some of the neuroscience of how we learn. So uh, I love sharing about this because it certainly could have made my own learning journey much easier to have known some of these insights. And I think when people get a grip on how some uh, how simple some of these ideas are, uh, it it can be invaluable for their own learning and also for your learning when you're teaching one another and working in groups. Nice, nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'll have to say, uh, you did a, uh, a kind of a learn talking about learning, you did a learning session uh, with uh, Chris and I and some other people uh, uh, we work with and do engineering with. And I have to say you had quite the impact. So uh, discussions about your content went on for days after uh, after you left. And so uh one person in my team or mob was very enamored with uh, a lot of the concepts. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we really appreciate your contributions to the community and uh, to our teams. So, <laughs> um, and it speaks I, well of Hunter that they were so in, you know, really involved in trying to get to the bottom of how we really learn. And it can super be just so helpful to people to get some insights in how we make those neural connections and how we can like stabilize them more quickly and efficiently in our brains. Yep. Well, learning how to learn, it's a, <laughs> it's a very important thing. And I think that not, not enough people out there pay attention to that concept. So uh, it's a great thing to talk about. Yes. And it's more exciting than you think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think maybe the tie in here to a lot of our audience uh, comes from a software development or engineering or product development uh, background or a kind of agility background. And so to be agile and adapt to the market, be poised to adapt um, basically means I think you're learning all the time. <laughs> I remember early in my career, uh, I remember talking to someone in there like, well, I got out of the real techie part of tech because it required me to learn all the time. I didn't want to learn anymore. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and, uh, and so if we are going to be in a space where we're constantly learning all the time, I don't know, I, I suppose, what are some of your, your go-to things for someone to consider, think about, look into who's kind of in that product development or tech space? Yeah. <laughs> well, so many different aspects, but I, I'd like to hit on two of them. So the first one is that when you have, like they study little mice and they tend to do uh, not mentionable things to mice, but one thing that they do do that, that doesn't necessarily uh, hurt the mice long-term is they can deactivate their dopamine systems. And these are very similar to the dopamine systems that humans have. And people generally have a bit of a feel for what dopamine does. It's that that drug that kind of makes us look forward to something or enjoy something. Um, And it turns out that if you inactivate these, this system, the dopamine system, mice can't learn anything new. And it seems it's similar for humans. So there's something about dopamine, which is that that molecule or that helps us feel better or that that actually helps us learn as well. So it turns out that when we get 
a little bit interested, kind of curious, hooked on whatever we're trying to solve or learn, that when we actually do solve that problem, um, we, as it turns out, um, release dopamine right along that those little segments, and we it makes the neural connections that underpin our learning. So you can kind of think of our or learning of something as sort of like stringing a strand of beads together, kind of um, like, like creating a necklace. And when you get that aha feeling of, yes, I've learned something or I, I figured something out, right there, you, your dopamine neurons release a bunch of dopamine. And that allows those beads of your neurons to connect together. So uh, so what's I think fascinating is when you're working together with a few other people and you're talking to one another and you look up into someone's face and they have that look like they get what you're saying, you have a release of dopamine and it helps you feel better. So this is part of why when you're working in an ensemble, you actually can enjoy what you're figuring out together more deeply than you can sometimes enjoy it when you're just working on your own. Because you not only get that dopamine hit from, I figured, I figured it out, but you get that dopamine hit from, ah, we're reacting to one another. So, so that's one important issue in learning is if you make yourself more curious about something, or, and or if you're working with others and you're helping one another and interacting with one another, you can actually make those neural connections of learning more easily and more enjoyable and you can make them stronger and more solid. So mm. that's one thing about learning. But the second thing is, I think it's, it's as important or perhaps even more important. And that is that when you retrieve ideas from your own mind, you strengthen those neural connections in the best way possible. So what I mean by that is, let's say that you're trying to remember an al algorithm. So you can read the algorithm on a page, you can, um, you, or you can retrieve that algorithm from your own memory. And if you do it from your own memory, you'll actually strengthen your ability to remember and to use that algorithm. So retrieval practice is a key part of learning. Nice, nice. Yeah, and I think... There is this natural tie, and it's interesting to hear the neuroscience behind it, but when even if I'm alone and I learn something, the, the next thing I want to do is increase the, the, the happiness, joy, dopamine, <laughs> and share it with someone else, right, and see their reaction to it as well. And that sharing is part, I, I guess it's it's fun, but it's also helps strengthen those connections of, of what you've learned. And, um, and I guess um, a follow-up question I have is, I'm starting to remember back to the, the the training session. And one of the things, one of the aha moments I had then that I'm trying to reconjure here and share with you all is uh, the, the connections uh, that the dopamine is involved in is not just recall, right? That's important as well, right? Like kind of like jeopardy knowledge, right? I, I was trying to remember the terms you used where it was, was it procedural connections or habits and, and these kinds of things as well. Do you mind uh, touching on that, like the distinction uh, between those two? Sure. And, and first of all, let's step back yeah. and look at what you just did right there. You <laughs> were retrieving the information. And that is a key part of learning. And notice what that retrieval did was it clarified what you could remember and what you couldn't quite remember. <laughs> so this is part of why retrieval practice is so important because, I mean, I'm an expert on learning, right? And I will sit there, I'll look at a page in a book, for example, and I'll be, 
you know, I've got that. I have really got that. I know I've got it nailed down. And then I'll flip the page and I'll say, okay, now what was that? And I am shocked oftentimes at how, how I, I fooled myself. It's called an illusion of competence in learning. And all of us are really, really good at illusions of competence in learning. Part of what this is, is when you hold something temporarily in mind, it um, you have it only in, in working memory, which is, you know, mostly short-term memory. But if you try to retrieve it, that's when you can double check to make sure that it's in long-term memory. Mm. So... As we're learning something, we put that information, we store it in these necklaces of, of information in our long-term memory in the neocortex. And, but it turns out there's two ways that we can store that information. So one way is that we can go, and you don't need to remember these, these different pathways, but just <laughs> one is the habitual pathway. And that's through the basal ganglia. It's the procedural learning pathway. The other is through the hippocampus. That's the declarative learning pathway. So you can just kind of think of it as you can lay links because you do things so often that it's a habit and you don't even need to think about it. Or you can learn something explicitly. And that's you have to think about it in order to be able to explain it or what you've learned. Oftentimes what you've learned through this habitual system, you can do without even thinking about it, but you can't explain it either. That's okay. Um, so, so these two, it turns out if you do something over and over and over again, so let's say that you use um, a certain um you know, way to drive home over and over again. Um, or uh, you might use some coded key to remember uh, a certain um, a procedure that you do uh, on the computer over and over again. You may, if you do it enough, you can do it without even thinking about it. You just press on this key and you can remember, although you don't, often think about it, all these different, much more complex actions that are done by this, by this key. So oftentimes it can be very much worth your while to, um, you know, to learn some of these, uh, you know, different abbreviations for you know, different um, types of actions that you do habitually because that's what experts coder, expert coders do. They learn these, these keys. They can very quickly, expert coders are always really fast. And if you can just make it a habit, memorize some of these um, expressions, it can make your coding be much simpler and faster. Uh, it's just much easier to do. So again, you just, you want to keep in mind that there are like two different kinds of memories or skills. One is your explicit memory. The other is that habit memory. And the more you do something, the more you'll get like not only that explicit memory, but also the links of that habitual memory. And that can make your coding much faster. I'm reminded of code katas in general, right? So the whole the whole point is to do it over and over again, start over, rinse, repeat, uh, maybe getting faster each time, not necessarily changing the outcome each time. Um, and, you know, very similar to a martial arts kata um, versus, yeah, versus, uh, you know, maybe, you know, learning, learning about something declaratively by searching for it on the internet uh, maybe you copy over some code and you don't think about it again. Maybe you're forced to go back and search for it again because you've forgotten it since you maybe you don't have to recall it, um, you know, besides maybe the immediate reading through the code. So yeah, I find that very, very fascinating is, um, you know, and also the effects of sleep on on maintaining knowledge over time and, and repetition. So I, I think all of that is very interesting. 
Yeah. Um, it it yeah, all that, plays an important role. Yes. I was just going to say before we leave the habits thing, I think it's it's such a, a big in learning to code well to to be a, a good a good coach a good technologist a good person <laughs> in general so much of it is beyond just factual knowledge so factual knowledge is very important right because you need you need that foundation and basis but i think you know it's like if you memorize everything there was to know about programming and you just had it all in facts would that make you a good programmer no and so like chris is talking about the kata is where you you know, reinforce the mechanics of uh, what you do, you know, over and over again. So whether it's, you know, test-driven development or something like that, that frees up the space for your mind to think about other things. And um, and I, and that's one thing I like about, because you, you mentioned it earlier with the group learning, uh, with the ensembling or mobbing, and um, is that you can really not only learn, like, you know, watch a video of Chris coding, you know what I mean, so to speak, and hear him talk about coding, but seeing him code and seeing the keystrokes and seeing like, oh, these are the habits I could pick up um, are, are very, are very valuable. And uh, yeah, well, yeah. Just but to it's, add to that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So if, but so we tend though, sometimes we have to watch it because we tend to dismiss the importance of factual knowledge. Sure. And let's say you did know all of those facts. Yes. Is that the answer to, you know, being a great coder? No. Yes. Would that help you on the path to becoming a great coder? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, but one idea that's really important here is the idea of interleaving. Mm. So if, if you have access to a fact, that's helpful. And if you have access to another fact, you know, that's helpful. And a bunch of facts, that's helpful. But the reality is you're often alternating between the different facts you need. And some of the facts from a neuroscientific perspective are very closely kind of located in the brain, at least metaphorically speaking. They overlap a little bit with one another. So what I mean by this is sometimes one fact or one skill or one concept is very close to another one. But sometimes you need that one as opposed to the other. So it can be a very good idea to practice with like uh, facts or skills that are closely related but confusable and alternate, that is interleave between these different approaches because that will help you get faster with selecting the right approach for the right situation. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I have a question about interleaving. So, so that um, there's the benefit of the closeness. Is there a, is there a benefit to distance? Like, uh, for example, I like studying different uh, languages, and so I, you know, I spend time learning, uh, you know, Spanish and Japanese and other things. Um, it, is it better to interleave just within a single language? multiple languages or a completely different uh concept like um if i is there any benefit to interleaving japanese with uh um you know software concepts uh, you know spend 15 minutes studying something in in japanese and 15 minutes studying something on you know amazon web services and uh you know python apis like hey. Oh, that's a great question, because the answer is, uh, yes, there's a great benefit, and no, there's no benefit. <laughs> uh, and it depends on how you're looking at it. Um, so, like, let's say that, you know, when you're coding, you're not normally also, like, looking up and speaking in Japanese and then glancing back down and continuing to code. In other words, you're not, like, going back and forth or mostly, now it depends, but mostly you're not sitting there and speaking in Japanese and then turning to someone and speaking in Spanish. Yeah. But, uh, you know, occasionally, 
that may be your job. You're translating between those two languages. So absolutely, then you'd like to interleave. You're probably interleaving at a sentence level, mm. not at a word level. But um, there's great evidence to show that if you are, let's say that you're going along and you are studying um, Japanese, th there's, there's very intriguing evidence, I should say, that you're, you release metabolites in the portion of the brain that you're using right there. And after a while, that portion of your brain that you're working out, just like an exercise of certain muscles, becomes fatigued because of the met metabolites that have been released in that area. Mm. So it can be helpful to just like when you feel yourself tiring, and that could be different, you know, how long that is for different people and depending on what your expertise is, it, it can be helpful to switch to something different because it's using a different part of your brain. But more than that, when you are, let's say that you're trying to figure something out, you're trying to, you're, you're, you're working away, you're trying to code something, and you just are stopped. You, you can't figure out how to do it. it. You can keep trying a little, you know, a while, but when you're really getting frustrated, it'd be a good idea to switch your attention to something completely different. And what that does is later when you will return, or let's say you don't put your attention on anything at all, you you go off and you make a cup of tea or you have dinner with the family or you know just something unfocused. When you do return, you return at a bit of a different neural kind of location, slightly different. It's like you're look you you climb back out up the mountain, but you used a slightly different path to get there. And it can help you make that creative breakthrough that you needed to mm. be able to, you know, uh, solve that problem or, you know, do that bit of programming that you were trying to tackle. So this is why, you know, there's, depending on the situation, um, changing your, your thinking to a different topic can be, uh, can be useful. But on the other hand, well, to go even deeper, about 2% of the population are what they call super taskers. These are people that can easily switch their thinking from one, one area to another area. So um, imagine a, a, a emergency room physician. They can easily switch from one task to another task to another task, and they're really good at it. They don't lose their efficiency. Likewise, mm. for a, a race car driver or a world-class chef. But for 98% of the population, including me, if, if you switch your tasks back and forth, for example, I'm working on the computer and then I check my cell phone, and I, I, you know, so I'm switching my concentration. Um, then it actually, for most people, you lose about 30% of your efficiency. So think of it as you put these beads, you know, on this, on the necklace, and then you just let them all fly away. And now you've got to get them together as you're continuing work. So it can be a better idea to focus but again, you can tire if you're focusing too long, which is part of probably why that Pomodoro technique of, in general, around 25 minutes of focused activity followed by a five minute or so break can often be a useful approach for keeping your attention on something and then resting your brain afterwards. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I feel uh, wait the, the comment you made about switching tasks so I, I find if i study languages but then go do something code related or uh, maybe even learn to put together an ikea furniture or something um the the fatigue is is suddenly not there thinking about the new thing so i, I think I, I i can recall expressly feeling that um and uh yeah so that, that's that's very interesting um and and also, I'm also reminded, uh, you know, my my grandparents would speak Romanian at home, 
And when I was learning uh, Spanish, you know, I'd get confused between, you know, leche and lapte sound very similar. Uh, and they both mean milk, you know, one in Spanish, one in Romanian. And so, uh, you know, I'd be doing poorly on Spanish tests because I'd be, you know, so, so had I, had I done some interleaving between Spanish and Romanian, I think I would have been much better off uh, in, in those classes. So, uh, Oh, it's those easily confused concepts. Yes. Yeah, easily yeah. confused concepts. So, so both of both of those comments were very insightful for me. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Romania is such a fascinating place. I, I find Romanians are just amazing in how they can speak virtually flawless American English. I mean, <laughs> you just wander around, and I mean, it's not everybody, but like yeah. a lot of people. And I gather that in Romania, there's a tradition of just watching movies flat out yeah. uh, without subtitles and so forth or you know with with the uh original um you know sound and mm -hmm. it really is quite different than in some countries yeah yeah you you said something earlier that i wanted to ask more about um you were talking about the value of connections of related concepts and i'm, I'm wondering if you can uh add more onto that and maybe explain my experience. So when I have noticed, because Chris's example was, uh, you know, what was it Japanese and let's say C++ or something, yeah. right? like two things that are, what I've noticed though, is when you study things that almost kind of relate to anything, like kind of principles and practices or interacting well with other, you know, they almost connect to everything. And I feel those same dopamine hits, you know, more often when you interleave something very generic and almost applies to anything and then studying something very specific. Um, is, is there value to the close connections when you're inter interleaving like that? Um, like some two things that are related to a certain degree, but not exactly the same. <laughs> what that does. So your brain is, um, it is differentiating when you're learning, like if you're learning two concepts, you're learning about the differences of those concepts. And mm. Some people, so, but it, it kind of, think of it as a bunch of dots just scattered and appearing on the wall. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of dots. So kind of draw a fuzzy circle around some of those dots, you know, like capture a quarter of the walls dots. Mm -hmm. And another fuzzy circle that kind of overlaps like a Venn diagram with the others. Yeah. That's kind of what you're doing when you're learning about two concepts. And if you're learning them as very different concepts, you actually kind of separate them in your brain. Uh, so that in some sense, it's like you, those, those two Venn diagrams don't separate or they don't overlap anymore, mm. but you can. Um, so some people, um, they learn concepts in a way that is like, that's my concept of a coffee cup is always that it is a transparent glass coffee cup. And I won't drink coffee out of anything else. And that actually is the basis of a, um, of a, a paper in, uh, in a recent Nature Neuroscience Journal. Uh, and other people are like a coffee cup is just anything that holds coffee. So you can think of one is having, you know, like a big circle. The other is a very small, very distinct circle. Why am I saying this? Because um, it, some people have real trouble seeing the commonalities, like making a metaphorical leap between one type of idea and another, it's because their neural concepts are really separate. Mm. So it's an advantage because you can always see the difference if you have very separate neural conceptions of two different things. But it's a disadvantage in that if you have an overlap, then you can start to see the commonalities much more easily. So um, some people, have, if you've ever noticed, some people... Like if they can see all the different, you know, the individual trees very easily. 
But if you try to get them to step back and see the big picture of like the general purpose of what they're doing with their coding, they kind of can't. They really struggle with it. And it's it part of it is how their brain defines concepts. But I should point out that what Chris is doing when he's learning a, a another human language, it, it can be very helpful for thinking creatively about what he's doing when he's coding. Because, you know, it's a way of thinking generally, and he will unconsciously begin to be able to build bridges and see new concepts in his coding that actually arise because of the metaphors he's making when he's language learning and the way they parse things in different languages. So, and it's really cool to learn like a different Indo-European language, even more cool to learn a non-Indo-European language because you learn to parse reality in very different ways. I think uh, that reminds me of just Japanese versus English. Like one, one reason I'm fascinated with Japanese is just the subject, uh, subject verb arrangement is completely different. Um, and yeah, I mean, that may translate to code because maybe, you know, maybe you would think front to back in one, in, in one language and back to front in another. Uh, and, and maybe that translates into, you know, how you, organized variable de definitions or something i don't know i'm just you know speculating here but yeah that's it's possible for sure. yeah yeah one thing we're doing with our granddaughter is so she's about six months old now so we're exposing her to uh like someone sits and speaks with her her daddy speaks with her in spanish it's chilean spanish which is kind of the equivalent spanish wise of Glasgowian English. It's really uh, an accent. But uh, <laughs> mommy speaks in English. And then we have someone who is a family friend who is speaking in, in Mandarin with her yeah. and in French with her. And she's just like, just keep coming. You know, I love it because it's her habitual system is very, very strong at this age. Yeah. So she can learn it without even having to study it. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um I, ha I had some qu questions related to ai that maybe we can come back to but one thing you just said um might may relate to learning um is there a difference um between let's say reading aloud or hearing someone else read aloud or thinking internally code in my head and then putting in the keyboard versus hearing someone else say it out loud and then I process it and then I put it into the keyboard. Is there, you know, is there, is there differences going on there? Cause that's, that's, uh, it's something that comes up a lot with people who mob for the first time is they have a, a different experience. And um, sometimes it's hard to put words to that. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts there <laughs> on the differences between audio and uh, internal thinking and that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's such an interesting question. Um, So, First off, let's say that I say the word bowl. If I say it, or I read it, or I hear it, or I see a picture of a bowl, it in general activates roughly the same bowl area of my long-term memory. Now, there's research done by my colleague, uh, Beth Rogowski, and she studied whether people, um, whether there's a difference between hearing it or reading it themselves. And she finds that there's no difference. Hmm. My own, and I, I be, well believe that. And I think it's because um, the same underlying activations are taking place, whether you're hearing it or you're reading it. Mm. But there are going to be subtle differences in how you get how you're processing and how you're inputting that information. And that is not necessarily going to be captured by, you know, just a very rough test of do you understand basically the same general ideas of this text, mm. whether you hear it or whether you um, read it. So I can well believe that people have, I mean, for me, 
um, I sometimes, because I don't have the best working memory, I don't have a really high capacity. Like my colleague, Terry Sanowski, I mean, his working memory is just like unbelievable. He probably can hold 25 items easily. And I'm very lucky to hold three. So, um, <laughs> so the thing is, it, it's hard for me to, now I'm kind of like, what were we talking about? <laughs> um, so what are we talking about? Um, well, maybe one thing that I could tie into this is, I wonder if it's not comparison, you know, like when you're an ensemble and you just hear someone say it or you read say it, I think it's maybe the behaviors that follow it. Because what you said before maybe ties in, right? So if I hear something and then it's a conversation where I respond back with the clarification question or I put it, I process it and I do something with it. And then that leads to them seated on the screen. And then that leads to another question. It's it's kind of, uh, what were you saying before? The retrieval is like a test and a strengthening of, of that that knowledge or concept. Uh, so maybe it's the, the behaviors of a conversation about something versus like a an, an act in and of itself, like of a reading act or a listening act. <laughs> yeah. That could be, and part of what's happening that may be yeah. happening as well in, in mobbing and ensemble kinds of situations is that like when I hear someone say something, mm -hmm. I... I immediately have this thought, part of this thought, part of another thought, part of another thought, like all of these different, you know, semi inchoate thoughts are flying into my brain. I can only hold so much. So uh, I'll grab onto one thing. And this is a very different reaction than when I'm reading something or working necessarily on, on my own, you know, reading uh, and trying to work on something uh, a problem i'm trying to solve it's much more dynamic i think and and really broad ranging and inchoate and i'm trying to grab a part of one thought and pin it down as i'm discussing with someone else and in some ways that can be much more creative mm, gotcha gotcha okay yeah so it's like they're good for different things yeah and and that that's usually yeah. what we find is if people need time alone to go process it or read it, you know, that's good. And if they need time to come back into the ensemble and verbalize it and talk about it, those, those are both uh, quite valuable. Yeah. And, uh, and so, sometimes, and I bet a, a fair number of people are like this, whoops. Um, and that is simply that um, when I'm thinking about something, sometimes I just like to go off and think on my own. Yeah. And then talk with others. Um, because I want to know if my thinking is off track and I can get that feedback from others. Mm -hmm. But when I'm around others, I'm a little shy. So sometimes, you know, I'm just kind of like sitting there thinking fuzzily and the thoughts all remain rather in the weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Is um, So, you know, I know that like whenever I look up things on learning to learn better or something, it, it's, it's not just interleaving, it's, it's spacing and interleaving, right? Um, you know, and so kind of riffing off the conversation idea, maybe you have more of that immediate recall and ideation that happens. Um, and then, and then, you know, with agile retrospectives, it's thinking about an event that happened earlier, right? So maybe, maybe you're learning about something that went well or went poorly, uh, and you're thinking about it again later. So, so the spacing aspect of it is now you're recalling something that happened earlier in the week that you may not have even thought about later. Um, and I think that gives it a much better chance of surviving, uh, that idea surviving long-term. Um, and then, and then it might even lead into like an annual timeline retrospective or something where you think about it maybe a year later, uh, from your notes or something and be like, Oh yeah, that, you know, that, and, um, so, so yeah, that active recall over time, maybe. <laughs> so, well, let me, uh, so I, I have, this is true confessions time. <laughs> so we'll talk about what you just described, but on a micro scale. So on okay. a, just a few minute scale. So when we were talking earlier, for some reason, do you know, everybody does this. I just had a brain fart about the word hockey. 
Yeah. And I was like, you know, and I was like struggling and like dancing around to not reveal the fact that I just had a brain fart about, you know, hotkey. <laughs> and so, um, so then as we went off and discussed everything, you know, and my mind was completely not on that, you know, it was like, oh, that word is hotkey. <laughs> and it came out of nowhere. But in reality, what it was, was I was not focusing on what I was trying to recall. And so that while I was not focusing on it, there's another part of my brain or another network that could actually go, oh, you know, that's the connection you wanted. But it can only do it when I was not focusing on it. Mm -hmm. So, so this just, so that was like, it took me, I don't know, about, eight, 10 minutes, and suddenly that word occurred to me. But this kind of thing where you're struggling with, you know, a little connection or maybe to make a bigger connection, to like put some ideas together. What what happens is if you give yourself time, and especially sometimes when you allow yourself to sleep, as you had mentioned, what happens is that you're, your brain, um, it makes connections and like smooths and refines. So you can almost think of it like, you know, all those dots that we threw up on the wall, they kind of would tighten together and they'd become, an, you know, a nice, elegant, um, you know, tighter set of connections. This is consolidation and it takes place through what you've mentioned, which is well, called spaced repetition. In other words, you're drawing those ideas or retrieving them over time, preferably even over several days. And that will really strengthen those concepts. All right. Nice. Nice. So it's almost like, uh, to use a coding term, when you sleep, your brain refactors your, your concepts. <laughs> and makes it, them That sense. is a very, and it, it's actually, that's so spot on to what is actually happening in your brain that um, it's, it's a really good phrase. <laughs> nice. Well, um, uh, I told you before that uh, the discussion of your concepts and what you taught us uh, uh, was discussed for quite a long time in our, uh, our ensemble after after your training session. And uh, also what's been happening in our ensemble is we've been using more uh, uh, AI tools. And uh, one thing that's come up that I'd be interested in your take on it is uh, uh, <laughs> one question is, how can we use AI without negatively impacting our ability to learn and problem solve? <laughs> and so oh, do you have any advice here where we don't become, you know, too dependent on a tool, I suppose. <laughs> so I have to bring up that um, IQ scores were found to, there's the Flynn effect, which is that IQ scores have increased from the 1930s to the 1970s. So, oh, great. Why did that happen? It's thought to be because of learning and education. Now, IQ scores have recently been found to have been falling from 1970 until today. So we can't just sort of waltz around and say, well, you know, yeah, but education has nothing to do with that. I mean, if it factored into the first, it factors into the second. <laughs> what happened in 1970? Well, that's when um, handheld calculators started coming out. And that's when uh, teachers started saying, but you don't need to remember things, you know, like the multiplication tables, because you can always look them up. As it turns out, um, sure, you can always look it up. But if you haven't taken the trouble to actually remember and memorize you know, I mean, memory is not a bad thing. I remember giving a statistics, an engineering statistics test once, and one of my students comes marching up after I handed the test back. And he says, you know, he thrusts in my face and is all red line. He says, I don't understand how I could have flunked this test. I understood it when you said it in class. We've gotten so like crazy that, you know, conceptual understanding is the only key to learning that we've gotten that if you don't actually get those insights into your own brain, 
that you actually really haven't learned it. And it is similar for what's going on with AI. We need to be, and we will eventually become more careful and cognizant of the fact that um, we still, we can use AI as a tool, but we still have that mountain of, of learning and get those ideas within our brains uh, if we want to be able to use that AI more effectively. It does make me so mad. So, you know, everyone is always like, oh, Finland, Finland is the best country in the world. They all, they, they have the greatest teaching and their students do best, best on math in the PISA tests, what are called the, the PISA tests, uh, which are done by the um, OECD. And that's supposed to be the best way of determining whether a country is really good. And um, it turns out that OECD can manipulate the rankings, they can, of different countries, depending on whether they like their systems or not. There's another, uh, and they really like Finland's systems. There's another uh, nation or international test called TIMS where they really don't do this kind of manipulation or potential manipulation. And Finland's middle of the pack. Why am I bringing this up? Because uh -huh. when I was speaking in Finland to a group of science, technology, engineering, and math professors, they were telling me, the students here, they just can't learn they they don't have a good background in in math they can't seem to be able to pick it up very effectively and most of these professors talking to me had they were from originally from countries where they used methods for learning that that incorporated some rote learning mm -hmm. like uh like the middle east like china like india so what I'm really saying here is don't just think that, oh, because we've got AI, we don't need to remember or memorize things anymore mm -hmm. because that way lies danger. I, uh, I, I'm reminded of the studies about uh, Google Maps and other mapping systems and their relationship to Alzheimer's disease. And they're saying that the, the use of the mapping, uh, mapping aids like that, uh, um, possibly contributes to alzheimer's disease because you're the act of trying to find your way on a map was very defensive against the disease so it was a very interesting um series of things and and so you know it's the the people making the tool obviously have have learned a lot and know a lot and the people using the tool may still be thinking about you know because I think, uh, you know, one thing is, is that with the use of generative AI for coding, you're not thinking about the, the low level implementation, but you're thinking a lot about architecture, a lot more about architecture. So, um, so maybe it's, you know, just like with calculators, if you know, you, you may, you may know how to use a calculator and you might be relying on it to use multiple, to do multiplication tables. But then, you know, do you go on to to calculus and and other, you know, higher level concepts, right? Because if you stop before the higher level cal concepts or calculator, you know, the base functionality of calculators is not as useful, then you're not exercising those areas of the brain anymore. Like maybe that's <laughs> like that in my mind, oh. it's like you can you can build up, right? But if people stop and just choose not to learn, I think that's the danger, right? Like that's the. Yeah. And yeah. there's there's actually interesting information or interesting research that shows that if you are involved in um action style video games, that those really help enhance your cognition, particularly if you're older. Yes. <laughs> and, and there's that's, that's there's me. A, yeah. <laughs> so there's wonderful research published in Nature. Um, uh, uh, by Adam Gazali and there's uh, other, Daphne Bavalier also does wonderful research. But I mean, think about it this way. If you're like looking at uh, a doorway and you're trying to see, you know, is somebody going to pop through that doorway? You actually 
use your cognition in a very in you know kind of enhanced way hmm. because you're you're trying to even if it's pretend world you're trying to avoid being metaphorically killed and it does like sharpen your cognition hmm. but just to go off on a completely different tangent um there is something called map habit and map habit what it does is um it uses that habit-based system for those with Alzheimer's to help them so that, because what Alzheimer's does is it destroys the hippocampal system, but it leaves, at least for quite some time, it leaves in place that procedural habitual learning system. So for example, my father passed away of Alzheimer's um, and what he used to do, he was a very smart man. So uh, so uh, he would, he, he knew he had Alzheimer's. He would forget the word. So he would, he wrote it on the bill uh, right underneath his hat. So he uh -huh. would pull off his baseball cap and there would be the word Alzheimer's. Wow. So he would go up to a clerk, for example, in a store and he would be trying to explain something, but he couldn't, he couldn't explain it very well, but he needed to say to her, I have Alzheimer's. That's why it's hard for me, but he couldn't remember that word, but he turned remembering the word Alzheimer's, which is a, a you know, a hippocampal act into a basal ganglia habitual act by simply putting it on the under the bill of his head. He could pull that down, that's a procedural action, and then read, I have Alzheimer's. So uh, if if anyone there uh, out there has uh, relatives with Alzheimer's, I highly recommend a map habit, which gets into mapping, but uh -huh. using that that basal ganglia habitual system to help those uh, who are suffering from that I know, uh, disease. I know we need to close out, but is that similar to like mind palace memory exercises or? Um... It's, it's different because mind, well, mostly mind palace, you know, using that um, memory palace sort of thing is more for remembering the declarative types of ideas. This one is turning it into a habitual action. kind yeah. of action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but memory palace is powerful, but um, sometimes in language learning, just doing things over and over again, uh, practicing with those words and interleaving with them can be uh, just as powerful as using that um, memory palace. All right. I love it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And I love it. And um, I'll tie into one point and then we can round it out, but it's just, I love what you said earlier in response to the AI question was that it's, it's not just, uh, you know, what you learn, the fact or the procedure, but the kind of person you're becoming uh, while you're learning. Right. And so if you become over on a tool, you learn, you lose what happens in that process. And I absolutely love that because that's a, somewhat of a, a classic concept of when you're learning is it's the byproduct is you <laughs> in, a, in a certain way. Right. And that's, that's yeah. the main goal in, in many ways, not just a certain skill or a certain set of facts um, or something. Right. And so what kind of person you're becoming. Cool. Well, um, we are at time, uh, but this has been really, uh, I feel the dopamine. I feel, I can't say the words you're talking about. They're going to my brain, but I think that's happening right now. And uh <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, before we close out, is there anything you'd like to share or plug? No, just uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the kind of work I do with the uh, online courses and books, just go to barbaraoakley.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, to our audience, thank you so much. Uh, well, to our audience, uh, please sh like, subscribe, uh, share. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on uh learning how to learn the brain and uh, your questions and uh, on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and more. And uh, Barbara, thank you so much for being on the show. This was a wonderful time. And uh, uh, to everyone, have a good one and talk to you later. Bye. Bye, everybody.